your labor and when you're pushing. Also considering, uh, thinking back last week when we went through the stages of labor and that first stage that can be several hours uh, for some people, um, how long that, pro that process is can affect your ability to tolerate certain positions, right? So I'll have uh, patients talk about, oh, I heard it's really good to squat for labor and for pushing. And then I'll ask them, oh, when's the last time you held a deep squat for 30 minutes, 10 hour, uh, depending on how long you're going to push for. And, you know, usually people don't hang out in that position unless you're my mom and you're watering the grass or something. She loves to do that in a squat for some reason. Um, but it's a difficult position for a lot of people to achieve. So you want to just keep that in mind, especially when you are practicing birthing positions um, throughout your pregnancy to see what's comfortable for you. Uh, and then thinking about any available equipment or amenities in the birthing facility or that you can bring with you like a birth ball or a peanut which I'll show some of pictures of later. Uh, and then energy conservation. So I always tell patients and people who take my childbirth class that a, pos a birthing position can mean a position you're in for labor or for pushing. So labor, you wanna be active, you wanna have variety, you wanna use gravity, um, you wanna be comfortable, but you also want to rest when you can, because again, that phase might last for several hours, um, so that when you get to the pushing stage, you're not fatigued and already tuckered out from being super active. So um, you definitely wanna think about how much energy you're gonna have available when you get to the part uh, where you're actually pushing. And I have a couple of basic principles here. So last week we talked a ton about constipation and toileting, which is great. And we have this image in one of our handouts for patients where we show proper toileting po posture. So you can see the toilet, you can see the footrest. So Linda talked about the squatty potty. Uh, so you could see that you want something under the feet here to make the knees higher than the hips. And then you want the belly bulged outward to release the pelvic floor, which I'll talk about when we talk about pushing. But basically the knees higher than the hips and the ankles slightly wider than the knees, that's another thing that people don't think about, uh, is helpful to open the pelvic outlet. So the pelvic outlet refers to this pelvis. You look at it from the top and from the front, this ring is the inlet. Versus when you look from behind where you have these two little bony prominences and the, where the tailbone would be, that would be more of the outlet. So for baby to travel from the inlet to the outlet, uh, you want to be in positions that open that bottom area. So this is pretty rigid in life, but during labor, a lot of hormones help make this a lot more flexible. So not only do your hip bones tend to separate a little bit, but your sacrum, which is back here, tends to move out of the way slightly as well. So keeping the, the knees flexed up and the knees slightly inward compared to the ankles will help to open up this back area. So just something to consider. And obviously having external support is super helpful, whether that's a partner or a doula or equipment to just help you move in and out of those positions. Just remember to be safe and to practice these early on so you're not um, knocking things over in the, in the delivery room. Um, so I have the same picture in several, I guess, um, positions or alignments to show that you can have, you know, si sitting in a, a on a toilet with a footrest can look like a squat when you bring the legs up. Same concept when you're on your back versus when you're on all fours. So thinking about this angle still replicated in this posture, even though this person is technically laying on their back now with their knees up versus this person who can be on hands and knees and they can be resting either on their arms, on a pillow, on a birth ball or a peanut, um, just to show you that the basic principles still apply. It just whatever is most comfortable for you. Okay. So for the birth ball, you just want to make sure that you size it based on your height because if it's way too big and you try to sit on it, your little feet might be dangling, which is not safe. Um, and same goes for the peanut, so making sure that it's appropriate or proportional to your size. Um, and making sure that it's burst resistant. So burst resistant doesn't mean it's not going to pop, it just means that if something does nick it and it creates a hole where air can escape, it won't just rupture, it'll deflate slowly, which is definitely what you want. Um, for the peanut, we don't suggest that you sit on these or straddle them. They're, they can't really tolerate a lot of pressure unless you're a child, um, but you can use them in the bed. So if you do end up getting an epidural and you can't necessarily walk around, you can still utilize a couple different positions with the peanut in the bed. So I'll show those in the next slide. Um, but yeah, basic birth ball and peanut. And 
couple of other options are the rebozo garment, which is originated from the indigenous Mexican practices of medicinal, um, basically their cult, their medicinal cultures, where you can use that kind of as an external support to help decompress or offload the belly and the spine. Or you can even see that, you know, playing a little bit of tug and tug of war can sometimes help generate more strength to help with the pushing phase. Um, and then you also have the squat bar, which is available at a lot of facilities these days. Most typically you think of it being used this way, right? When you're actually doing a squat in the bed with some assistance, so you don't have to hold your body weight up completely. But I like these images because you can use them in different ways. So you can be on your side like this person here with one leg up with support, using a rebozo or a garment to help with the upper body strength to direct some pressure downward. Same thing up here. So lots of different options. The biggest thing is to practice beforehand. You don't want to go into labor never having experimented with these things because you might not know um, how it feels until you do it in that moment. So it's good to practice ahead of time and figure out what feels natural and comfortable for your body. All right, so here are a couple of breathing positions. So the first ones at the top are obviously more in bed. So you can have the partner behind you. Uh, you can have yourself on your side with the peanut or a stack of pillows between your legs. You can also have the partner behind with the leg hoisted up. And then you can still make nice eye contact there and still coach your partner through some of that. And then you can go on hands and knees, but hands and knees can be variable depending on what equipment you have available which is shown here with the bed being elevated versus using a ball, right? So the ball's kind of nice because you can sway and you can rock and you can bounce. Um, but then obviously the stability of the bed is also nice if, it's, if the contractions are pretty intense. And then you have some seated positions. So either on the ball, partner assisted, on the toilet or on a chair. I like the backwards facing on the chair. You can also apply that position to the toilet, right? If you put a pillow, uh, on the backrest of the toilet and lean forward, you have the hollow cutout of the toilet seat where you naturally will feel some relaxation um, and you can kind of cue the pelvic floor and all the tissues to release in that position as well. And you can go to the bathroom if you need to. On this slide, we have some upright positions. So again, thinking about gravity, you want to use gravity to help baby drop into, into the pelvis to engage to be into the birth canal. Uh, so you can have the partner behind supporting, you can have a, a leg up, which gives a nice stretch to the pelvic outlet um, and the pelvic floor muscles or you can be squatted like in these positions, either using something for support, using a partner behind you, or I didn't draw it out on this slide, but you can have the birthing person in a squat, but facing the partner and leaning forward, which is sometimes a really nice one because in that position, the partner can massage the shoulders or the neck or the scalp, which can be really, really relaxing. So that's a nice one. Or using some traction and holding the upper extremities while the partner drops all the way down to the floor is also helpful and leaned forward on either a ball or you know even just a chair with your arms supported um, or a stack of pillows is sometimes really comfortable as well. Take, take, kind of take some pressure off the low back there. So yeah, as you can see, it's all the same principles of using gravity, opening the pelvis, relaxing the muscles. Um, and then you just kind of figure out what you like and what you don't like, and you have a ton of options to use during labor. So think of practicing these positions as a dress rehearsal so you're not um, doing the awkward, like, oh, where, where do you want to go now? Because the partners usually have to help with the um, transitions. So for pushing strategies, I wanted to go over some basic Kegel principles. So a big part of our job as pelvic PTs is to teach people how to properly contract and relax their pelvic floor. So a pure Kegel is a squeeze and a lift of the muscles. And you can see here, oops, I guess if I can play it, I guess it won't play. So. You can see on this image, there's the yellow opening, which represents the urethra, the pink, which re represents the vaginal opening, and then the anal opening down here. When these muscles squeeze or you do a kegel, you'll see these openings close, and then you'll see a lift inward. So you coordinate this with the breath, which we'll talk about in the next slide. You inhale to stretch the muscles, and you exhale to squeeze them if you're doing a kegel. A couple of verbal and visual cues that we give in the clinic include putting your sit bones together. So on either side here, this person's on their back, so their sit bones are visible. Imagine pulling these together or pubic bone and tailbone together versus tailbone or pubic bone together. 
And for those of you who have experience with a tampon, sometimes imagining a tampon in the vaginal canal and trying to squeeze and lift it up into the body is sometimes a helpful way to think about that. Or some people use the analogy of a straw in your vagina and trying to drink a smoothie up inward using that kegel motion. So if you wanted to try that, you can follow it up with the breath, which is on this slide. So on the bottom, you can see as somebody takes a deep breath in, the diaphragm, which is at the base of the rib cage, pulls down, which causes the belly to expand and the pelvic floor to then relatively drop because of the pressure change. So as you inhale, you can try it right now. Take a deep breath into your belly. So if you do yoga, it's that belly breath where you expand. And imagine all that air expands into your pelvis and causes the muscles to kind of melt or release a little bit. Now, as you exhale to let the air out, that's when you wanna activate the pelvic floor and pull the abs in to then direct that air back out of the lungs. So inhale to expand, exhale to then squeeze and lift the pelvic floor. So trying that a couple of different times, alternating between the inhale and the exhale can be very helpful. If you have trouble with that, come to the workshop tomorrow and we'll go over that in way more detail, but definitely good to just experiment and practice for anybody pregnant or not. So life skills for life. To learn how to do kegels properly. All right, so for pushing, how does this play a role? So the thing about pushing is you wanna make sure that the pelvic floor is relaxed, the pressure is being directed downward, and that you are not necessarily holding your breath the whole time. So I have two representations here of how you can push. One is using the exhale. So you can see here the open glottis refers to exhaling through the throat, and that also allows you to vocalize. So if you wanted to exhale and moan or use a low tone sound or scream. Uh, vocalization is helpful to relax that pelvic floor as well. Um, so the cue that I give for that is inhale, make your belly big. But since now we're working on pushing and not keggling, you want to keep the belly big as you exhale. So I use the term inhale, make your belly big. And as you exhale, make your belly bigger. So inhale, belly big, exhale, belly bigger. And that should kind of feel like when you're trying to pass gas and you try to force something out that way, you might feel that drop in the pelvic floor. Versus if you were to do that same thing, but instead of exhaling, you kind of catch your breath and you hold it in your throat as you continue to push downward. So if you inhale and make your belly big, exhale a little bit of air and then catch it. So you, you'll notice a change in the pelvic floor. For some people, they feel the pelvic floor go and release. For other people, the pelvic floor actually reflexively goes as you catch your breath. So we call this the Valsalva, Valsalva maneuver, which is when you hold your breath and bear down. So this technique can be very powerful for some people, but it can also be very inefficient if the pelvic floor muscles are not fully released or relaxed. So it can be more exhausting as well when you're constantly holding your breath and cutting off some of that blood supply. Um, so you definitely want to reserve the holding the breath type of pushing for maybe the very end when your you know, baby's already crowning and you just have two pushes left. It's definitely not something you want to do repeatedly um, for hours because it can be very, very um, draining on the body. So two strategies for pushing, but both represent the same exact mechanics. It just depends on what you feel. The purpose of the pelvic health uh, PT sessions, we can help you determine which strategy is best for you, especially because some people are starting with a limited, um, I guess limited experience with contracting and releasing the pelvic floor muscles. So if you've never done a Kegel in your life, this can be very confusing and feel uh, really uh, difficult to di differentiate. So we can work with you that way too, but just something to try. So either inhale belly big, exhale belly bigger, or inhale belly big, exhale, catch the breath and continue to push down and see how you feel. All right. So moving forward. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is training the pelvic floor muscles. So the thing about pelvic floor exercises is everybody thinks it's a kegel, which is partially true, but you also want good dynamic flexibility in the muscle. So the ability to relax the pelvic floor is required to do these exercises properly. So that inhaling to make the belly big is really important before you do any strengthening. Because if you think about the muscles in the jaw, as an example, if you're clenching your jaw, and I ask you to bite down, you can't really produce much more force because you're already tensing those muscles. So 
you would technically need to first relax the jaw and then produce that nice strong bite down to then activate the muscles. So same concept applies to the pelvic floor. You want length or flexibility before the strength. And with the strengthening, you want to increase the strength of the muscle fibers and create hypertrophy, which is the word for thickening of the muscle fibers to then make them stronger and more resistant to tearing when you give birth. So down here, you can see how much the pelvic floor has to stretch. Um, Muscles that are strong and well conditioned and have good blood supply are less likely to tear. So that doesn't necessarily mean you do a thousand kegels a day. It means that whenever you do a kegel, you understand how to also release the tension and then squeeze and lift back up. You're strengthening the cross bridges, which the fibers in the pelvic floor muscles, they attach through those cross bridges and the stronger those are, no matter how much stretch, they hold tight. So you have the flexibility to give without rupturing, which is what you want for vaginal childbirth. Um, and then for coordination, we give a variety of different types of kegels. So you can imagine squeezing and holding for 10 seconds. That's kind of the standard kegel out there on the internet. Uh, but you can also do quick contractions, which is less of a hold and more of a pulsing. So pinch, relax, pinch, relax, pinch, relax, versus an endurance hold, which is when you squeeze and you hold for an, a set amount of time. And then the last part of the puzzle is maximal versus submaximal. So I tell people, you know, muscles don't always behave in an all or nothing pattern. So if you've ever tried to lift a can of, I don't know, soda or a beverage off of a surface and you didn't realize that it was already empty, you might overshoot it and then use way too much force than necessary. So it can be a good or bad thing, especially if you spill, but you don't want to just train the muscles in such a, an aggressive way. You want to also be able to grade how much force you're producing by doing max contractions and also maybe 50% effort contractions, right? Also training with a cough or a sneeze to make sure the muscles can support against that in increased pressure. So all of this we go over in our PT sessions, but just to give you a general understanding of why the pelvic floor muscle training is important and why it's not enough to just do plain squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, right? So it's a good start, but there's definitely more to it than that. So lastly here, I have an example of a home program that I might give somebody with semi-decent pelvic floor strength. Um, think of a circuit where you have three different exercises and you do a couple of sets of each in a row and then you uh, repeat that as needed. So for example, down here we have the quick flicks. I might tell somebody, okay, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, pulse, pulse, pulse about five times in a row. Take a deep breath to release the pelvic floor tensions before you move on to the second type of exercise, which is where you squeeze and you hold the muscles for about five seconds at 50% of your maximum effort. So if I told somebody, squeeze your pelvic floor as hard as you can, and they get what that feels like and they feel that lift, and then I ask them, okay, squeeze the same, but only half amount of that effort, and they usually will sometimes feel that difference, and then I saw them just hold that amount of tension five times in a row. And then again, release the tension in between that exercise before you move to the last version, which is, I tell, that, I tell people that this is the go for broke exercise where you squeeze and hold 100% effort for as long as you can. For some people that's eight seconds, for some people that's 18 seconds, right? And then you get a variety of different types of kegels in one exercise circuit. And depending on the person's endurance and how well they can coordinate that, I might have them do that two times, you know, that whole circuit twice. Um, and then when they get stronger, we can increase that amount or progress to different positions and add some dynamic movements, like maybe um, balancing on one leg or while you're doing a squat or while you're bending forward. So you can train the muscles with those dynamic movements as this becomes more easy for the person. So yeah, just an example of one type of program. Uh, it's really important to talk to pelvic PT first before trying a specific type of program to make sure it's appropriate for you, especially if you're already having some symptoms of you know, urinary frequency or pelvic pain. So all the stuff we've already talked about, um, you wanna make sure that you're doing the appropriate type of exercise for your muscles so you don't make anything worse. All right, so I think that's it for me. So I'm